welcome to the Innovation Ecosystem Podcast. We interview remarkable and thought-provoking guests about innovation, leadership, and change in the world of business. Whether you're an executive or an entrepreneur, our objective is to help you and your organization create an entrepreneurial culture, become more innovative, and better able to respond to change. Each week, we'll deconstruct world-class performance from the arenas of business, academia, science, and sports. Each week, you can expect key insights, fresh perspectives, and proven tools you can use straight away to make you more successful professionally and personally. With your host, Mark Bidwell. Hello, this is Mark Bidwell of the Innovation Ecosystem. Welcome back, and if you're a first-time listener, welcome to the show. My guest today is Jenny Fielding, who I first met in a field in Wales when she was um, talking at the Do Lectures several years back. Um, She she goes into, um, well, she outlines a fascinating career, which started as a lawyer. Then she went into banking. Then she had her first startup, which was unlike the vast majority of startups, which was a a roaring success. She had a great exit after three years, which led her to work for the British, uh, for the BBC worldwide in digital innovation and, and, and investment. And she, you know, there's a few things here which are really relevant for those of us who are in large organisations um, that are potentially ex-growth and trying to re, re, re-kick, you know, kickstart the innovation engine or build um, innovation capability in organisations. And she really gets, you know, gets deep into the challenge of moving a legacy organisation like the BBC into a new digital era um, and how her entrepreneurial mindset and her passion for the overall mission you know, to change the culture at BBC enabled her to to view the opportunity as a positive challenge rather than an, an uphill battle. Although she does talk later on about the struggle is real in the context of um, entrepreneurialism, but this is equally applicable in the context of intrapreneurialism, which is essentially what she was doing at the BBC. Um, and then the, the other thing that's fascinating here is how her sort of love for marrying startups with corporates led her then to Techstars, where, where she's a, a managing director at um, Techstars, which is a bit, essentially the global ecosystem um, for, for startups that help innovators um, and entrepreneurs build great businesses. Um, so plenty in here. Hope you enjoy the show. So welcome back to the Innovation Ecosystem. This is Mark Bidwell. And with me today is Jenny Fielding, who's managing director at Techstars, where she invests in fintech and Internet of Things companies. And prior to joining Techstars, Jenny headed up corporate venture and digital innovation at BBC Worldwide, where she made strategic investments and led business development deals. So welcome to the show, Jenny. Thanks for having me. So Jenny, I mean, when we last met, you were um, you were at the at, at the BBC Worldwide, um, heading up, as I said, corporate venture and digital innovation. Before we get to that, just love to hear a little bit about your story. You you, you started off as a lawyer and then very quickly made a switch into tech. What what was what was behind that decision? Was that was that a purposeful decision that you do you get a, a legal training and then go into tech, or was it more sort of serendipitous? Yeah, I would definitely say I've had a um, an interesting and and rambly journey to through my career. Um, I think it is more common in the states for people to go on to law school and business school and higher education, but not necessarily manifest in those traditional careers. So actually, half of my class, graduating class, is not practicing law, which I think is an interesting data point. But um, yeah, I went to law school and and really loved the. Um, the idea of law school, but wasn't so enamored by the practice. Um, and I wound up um, in uh, a large banking organization where I was for a few years and, and learned a ton and, and really, really loved that journey. Um, and that was, that was JP Morgan, right? It was. Mm-hmm. It was. Um, both my parents are, are entrepreneurs. They both work for themselves. And I think the model growing up was very entrepreneurial, but uh, my two um, you know, jobs that I'd had um, after graduation were, you know, very corporate at, at large firms. And so um, one day <laughs> I had this idea um, and it was really based on a need. I actually had a, a boyfriend who was living in Germany and I was making, you know, very um, expensive mobile phone calls. This was back in 2006 um, and just thought there's got to be a better way to um, to do this. And so this was before Skype had come to the U.S. and um, before people in the U.S. were very much ahead on anything mobile technology. Um, so I came up with this idea of um, essentially just 
doing something very simple, automating what a calling card was doing, um, but not having to, you know, type in strings of numbers. And um, so we launched a company, um, mm-hmm. teamed up with some with some Scandinavians um, who at the time were very ahead in mobile technology. Um, we launched a company called Switch Mobile, um, which essentially was Skype for your for your mobile phone. Mm-hmm. We hit it kind of right time, right place, built out that company over a number of years, scaled it um, through Eastern Europe, um, and wind up being wound up being acquired. So um, that was my my poke into the entrepreneurial world. And I think, you know, learned a lot about technology, learned a lot about um, you know, building a company and what it meant to scale. And after that I was I was pretty much hooked. And and so I mean, to, interest. I mean, did you? Um, I mean, how much of this did you build while you you know moonlighting while you were still at J P Morgan? I guess the idea of moonlighting at J P Morgan doesn't really make much sense given the hours. I guess you were working, but <laughs> um, I think the idea was conceived while I was there, and um, you know, lucky enough. Um, I was surrounded by people that were um, were pretty savvy when it came to investing, and they also thought that this was a really interesting idea. They liked my entrepreneurial spirit, and some of the people that I worked with were the ones that um, wound up funding us. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was really great. But um, I left soon after we um, we incorporated the company to be full time um, at J.P. Morgan, which. Uh, which a little bit of a culture shock going from, you know, a large company to running a startup in, in my flat. So, yeah, yeah. But, and, and, um, and, and from that point until the sale, how, how many years are we talking about? Um, it was a little bit less than three years. So, um, that is not a typical entrepreneurial journey as I've found <laughs> out subsequent, but, um, you know, it was that first wave of mobile, um, investors. And I think the public were really starting to understand the full potential of mobile and we kind of hit it at the right time. So as you started this, um, this podcast with the word serendipity, I think, um, a lot of it had to do with luck and serendipity. Yeah. And perhaps we'll come back to some of the, um, you know some of the learnings that you that many first time entrepreneurs or second time entrepreneurs pick up before they before they hit hit the um the mother load if you like but it's because this is a very very rare story of someone who comes up with an idea and leaves their mainstream job and you know is able to transition into selling that business 3 years later it's a very very rare situation i guess isn't it yeah, I mean, as I said, I think that we were pretty lucky. Um, we were able to to build a pretty great team, and it was you know right time, right place. So you know, I tell a lot of founders, so much of of everything comes down to to timing. So for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. And then then um that then I think you you moved to British to BBC um after this, or was it the, were there some other f- startups between Switch Mobile and BBC? Well, um, since Switch Mobile, I've co-founded a number of startups, and so that's always going to be part of who I am. Is um, you know helping to incubate and um, you know accelerate early stage companies. So I have I have done that in parallel to other jobs. But um, the BBC was a really unique opportunity. Um, I met the chief digital officer while I was in California, actually, and um, he was looking to um, he and the CEO at the time were looking to start a ventures group. Um, and this is the this is the sorry the CEO of BBC Worldwide is it? Correct, okay, the CEO okay. um, of BBC Worldwide and the Chief Digital Officer, and mm-hmm. um, they were really looking for someone who was more of an outsider um, as opposed to someone that was kind of entrenched in the organization, someone that had built a company that had a little bit of investing experience, um, and that could bring a, pr- a fresh kind of um, you know West Coast perspective to to the group. Um, and so we set out to, um, put together a proposal, which ultimately got approved. Um, and so I wound up running that group in, um, in conjunction with the chief digital officer. And it was really an amazing learning experience, I think, for the organization and for, for me, because we tried a lot of different things. We tried spinning out a company, we tried acquiring companies, we tried incubating companies, we invested in companies, and it really was, um, a little bit of trial and error to figure out what would work in an organization um, like the BBC, an organization mm-hmm. with you know twenty thousand plus people. Yeah, because I mean it's a, it's the world's largest broadcaster, and I guess um, it does have. I mean, I, I know people who work there. I've never been directly exposed to the the company, although I'm a consumer of it, I guess. But I mean, I'm curious making the transition from being an entrepreneur with you know a number of activities to going into a large organization. 
I mean, what was going through your mind, I mean, as you made that decision? Because clearly, I guess, you know, a lot of our listeners are sitting in large organizations, incumbents, regulated, maybe long product life cycles, um, you know, with, with lots of, um, you know, new disruptive or new entrants and disruptive technology yapping at their heels. So what, what made you sort of step into that environment? Or did you not see it that way at the time? Well, I actually started off just consulting. It seemed like um, it was a really great opportunity. I've always kind of appreciated the the mandate of the BBC and what the BBC is from from afar, obviously as an American. But um, it seemed like a great opportunity to help um, a legacy organization kind of move into a new era. Um, the BBC had been very ahead in some digital technology, BBC.com or the iPlayer, and it was kind of um, you know trying to think of what would be next. What would be the next big thing. So I thought of it as, as this great challenge and just started consulting for them, trying to help out. Um, but ultimately kind of fell in love with the people there, um, with the mission and, um, you know, with the opportunity. And so wound up joining full time, um, in the role as it became, you know, more clear what the opportunity was. Um, I think to answer your question, um, in, in terms of, a, a big organization. I think, you know, I saw that as, as a great challenge. And I think as entrepreneurs, we're always looking for challenges. And so how can you take an organization that is highly bureaucratic, that is, um, very structured and that does have a lot of regulations and turn it into, a, um, you know, something that is more agile and that is more startup like. So I think that is one of the reasons why I joined. And so, I mean, I don't know whether, um, I presume you had a team who you were working with, some of whom were, from the legacy organization versus outsiders. And I just wonder if there are any any conversations or any um any 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 discussions you might have had with them to help them, you know, ch- evolve their mindsets and help them sort of, you know, um think differently about the opportunity because as you say it's bureaucratic, it's uh, there are lots of layers in there, there are lots of, you know, um it's just got it's 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 almost like a civil service from a cultural perspective, I guess. And I just wondered if there's anything that struck anything that any any conversations that stand out that sort of that it, where you were able to bring your new perspective to them to help them look at their their situation slightly differently yeah i mean the way that um i see corporate innovation is that it has to be a top down approach at the beginning and mm-hmm. so to have the ceo um the chief digital officer basically saying we'll protect you from all the bureaucracy here just go do your thing go do what um you were brought in here to do and we'll protect you from the rest so i think that when you're starting um you know things around corporate venture and corporate innovation you definitely need a champion at the top mm-hmm. who can open those doors and that can clear the clear the path so i definitely learned that and there was a ton of support at the top so i'd say um you know all of the business units for the most part were very exciting willing to embrace the change that was coming and to you know work with me and and the other people on our team um to kind of you know usher in the next the next generation of of what the organization was going to look like. So um, there wasn't a lot of resistance at the top level. I mm-hmm. think where you start getting resistance is kind of in the in the middle section, right? So let me give you an example. Um, you know, we invested in a, in a very interesting ad tech company that we thought could give the BBC more exposure to um, new geographies, new demographics. Um, so the head of the business units. We're very excited about it, right? Because this was new opportunities. Well, the um, the folks in the middle who had to crunch the numbers and who were actually responsible for carrying out um, what we were trying to do were less excited, right? Because it's mm-hmm. another thing on their plate. They're not getting paid more, except now you've increased their workload. And so I think one of the challenges with um, you know with corporate innovation is how do you motivate people at all um, at all areas um, at all levels of the um, organization? And in particular, in that specific situation, I mean, what happened to that that that? Um that platform, that that pro, that business that you were developing, did did that did that get killed by the sort of corporate antibodies or antibodies, or did you manage to um, navigate your way through it? Well, we were just minority share investors, so it's not like we were doing an acquisition, and it did um, work out well in that two business units wound up collaborating with the startup, um, and then the startup actually had a very good exit, so they were um, sold for two hundred million dollars, and um, everyone did quite well, in, including uh, BBC Worldwide. 
So we didn't see it, you know, fully play out, but we got the hint of where the friction would be should um, investing be a primary um, objective of, of the organization and that the friction was really in the middle layer of people. And so how do you solve for that? Yep, yep. And then I think you went on to, f- to found um, BBC Labs, which was what, an incubator within BBC? Yeah. So one of the things that we realized was that if we were going to have success in investing or in any type of, um, you know, innovation is that we needed to get people in those middle layers and the, in the lower levels of the organization also excited about, um, startups and innovation. And so when we started this, I wouldn't say that startups had the best reputation, um, around, you know, let's just say, you know, the UK or big Mm -hmm. companies. Um, so at the time, you know, the idea of leaving, uh, um, a big company like the BBC and joining a startup was maybe not as favorable as as it is today. It seems like um, you know that's been embraced much more um, across the board. And so, how did we get people excited about startups? And so, um, what we decided was we'd start something called BBC Labs. Um, it was really, I think, the first corporate. Um, um, incubation project in in the UK that that we can identify, um, and we would look at companies that were strategic to the various business units with the objective of getting the people not necessarily at the top of those business units, but say in the middle of those business units to get in to get engaged. And so what we did was we put BBC Labs right in the office in a great spot right next to where the CEO sat and all the C level executives, and so it got a lot of exposure. Um, and we selected six companies. They came, they worked from our office, and um, that was how we started BBC Labs. The real idea, though, was um, can we change the culture of the BBC? Can people get excited about working with startups because they meet these people? They meet them in the cafeteria, they meet them in the hallways, and um, they get to know them as people. They that resonates and they want to help them. They want to spend extra time, you know, as I said, you know, time that they're not necessarily being compensated for. They want to help them. And so that was um, it was it was a great program. And I did I do think it helps shift the culture um, at the BBC. And presumably quite a lot of ripple effects. So even if people were directly involved in the activities in the lab, they nonetheless, they were, as you say, they were exposed to them, they were bumping into them in the cafeteria and it began to shift things in that sense as well. Yeah, hundred percent. Um, you know, we had more people apply to be mentors, um, you know, in the, in the first year than we thought we would. And then after the first year, it really dominoes the second year. I mean, we just, that just doubled, right? So first people are a little bit tentative, but, you know, mildly excited the second year, you know, everyone wants to be a part of it. We had to keep, you know, some people out. So, um, so it was a really amazing, um, kind of coming together, of um, of departments of um, of different um, of different parts of the organization, and I think it was you know very successful. It's still you know going strong today. Yeah, that was my question: is how how is it? I mean, you left, I guess, what three two years ago, three years ago. Mm-hmm. I stayed on as um, an advisor to BBC Labs um, for about a year after I left because this was really my baby. I consider myself a founder of this, and I really wanted to see it successful. Um, but I think it's become, uh, you know, so I think a few things happened. One, it became ingrained in the organization and, and, you know, people started to embrace it. And so, you know, it, it definitely took a life on its own, which is what I wanted it to do. I didn't want it to be about, you know, Jenny's BBC labs. I wanted it to be about the organization's innovate, you know, next iteration of innovation. So that was one thing. And the other thing was the environment in London, um, and in the UK completely changed. And then, you know, every corporate had an, an innovation group and had a lab. And we really just saw the startup scene, you know, go from, from, you know, pretty small when we started it to, you know, one of the best ecosystems to, to start a startup in the world. And so I think the, you know, the, the confluence of those two things really helped. Yeah, fascinating. So um, th- then you, the next step, I guess, is Techstars. I mean, t- tell us, how, how did you, you know, how did that catch your attention? And, and what, what do you do with Techstars? And maybe just a little bit about for those who, I mean, a lot of our listeners are based in the US, but um, uh, maybe some of them, and I know Techstars is global, but maybe you can just explain what Techstars does to start with, actually. Yeah, so um, I, after 
being at the BBC for a number of years, really loved this idea of the the marrying of a startup and a corporate because I think the opportunities that each one can unlock for the other are you know really magnitude or magnify what they can do on their own. Um, and I think it's hard. I think it's hard for startups to work for work with early stage. I mean, work with corporates, and I think it's really hard for corporates to work with early stage companies. But when you can um, put them together, I think there's some real magic there. And so with that. Um, I was looking to do even more of that and really focus on that. And so I joined Techstars um, and wanted to head up some of their corporate programs. And so, um, as you said in the intro, I look after our fintech programs, which is in partnership with Barclays, um, and also our Internet of Things program, which has five corporate partners, GE, Bosch, Verizon, SAP, and PwC. Um, so I work with a lot of corporates who are all trying to figure out how do they infuse the um, the startup culture, the startup innovation into their organizations. So, um, so Techstars is a venture capital fund. We're a global venture capital fund, and we invest at all uh, stages of the um, entrepreneurial journey. And what we like to say is that we're creating the best ecosystem for um, startups to um, bring their products and services to market. Mm -hmm. um, and really the key word though is, is an ecosystem. And so we, we run 24 accelerators worldwide. Mm -hmm. We um, also have Startup Weekends, which you've probably heard of, and we yep. run 1,100 community-driven startup weekends. Um, and these are, you know, community driven weekends where people can come work on an idea and potentially launch something just in the span of, you know, a few days. Um, and we also have uh, a venture capital fund. We're on our third fund, $155 million fund. So, I mean, as you can see, people that are, um, you know, working on something for weekend through to, you know, proper investments um, and Techstars is, is part of that journey. And what distinguishes you? I mean, I was over at um, in Chicago. I think it's eighteen seventy four, eighteen seventy one. Which, which yep. I mean, how, how how are you different from from some of the others? I mean, what what's what's unique or distinctive about TechStars? Well, eighteen seventy one is is essentially a community, you know, ecosystem and um, and co working space where organizations like TechStars. We actually work from eighteen seventy one, so okay. it is it is our office in Chicago. Um, I think what makes us, you know, different from, you know, other accelerators you might hurt, you might have heard of, or other, you know, venture capital funds, is, you know, we have the the thesis that you can build great communities and great companies um, outside of, say, the Valley. And so, um, if you look at, um, say, New York, we run four programs there, and New York now has a very thriving um, startup scene and ecosystem. It didn't always have that. In London, um, we run about three programs as well. We run um, the Barclays FinTech program. We have our city program, and we run a program around digital media with Virgin. Um, in Berlin, we also have three programs. So we are definitely expanding globally, but with, with this idea that um, communities and companies can be built anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, if I look at the companies for the... Internet of Things. I mean, G, Bosch, Verizon, SAP, PwC. I mean, you know, there are a couple. I mean, I don't know how old G is, but um, you know, it's it's well, over, it's over a hundred years old, I guess, isn't it now? Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, how 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 does you know a company with that level of um of tradition and heritage, uh, you know, how how does that um, you know, engage with? I mean, what what are the, what are the challenges you see working with a company like G? You know, that they're wrestling with to actually ensure they maintain um. Their, their market share and their core business, but also are able to be sufficiently agile to to capture some of the emerging opportunities. I mean, I mean, maybe in the, in the sense that uh, British uh, BBC were having similar similar challenges as well in the core, if like in the middle management. What? How do you see these kind of challenges being dealt with in a in a company like GE, for example? Well, I mean, going back to what I said is where it has to come top down. So Beth Comstock, um, who is one of the top people at GE, is is the sponsor of our program, right? So when we were looking to put together this syndicate, we called Beth, and she's a big advocate of um, of startups and of what we're doing at TechStars. And um, you know, she said, "Yeah, we're we're in. We want to be part of what you guys are doing." It fit the the, the theme, which is industrial IoT and enterprise. Really fit the theme of um, what GE is focused on as well. So there were some synergies in terms of the theme. Um, but they know, um, you know, just like the BBC and any 
of these large companies that they have to get ahead of what's next and they have to be partnering with um, external uh, companies. They, they cannot have the mentality of if it wasn't built here because mm. they just won't, I mean, they're just not going to stay relevant. And so um, it's too costly to build everything internally yeah. and it's too slow. Um, and you know, they know it, the people at the top know it and the people everywhere else at the organizations know it. And so they're pretty excited to partner with us where we can curate a selection of startups who specifically can interact with their teams at a, in a very effective way. Um, and, um, yeah, they've been an incredible partner. Yeah. And I, and that comes back to the whole ecosystem point, I guess, is that there's, there's no companies on the planet that have the resources that they, you know, all the resources they need to actually be able to navigate their way into the future with, without support from the you know from the outside from the ecosystem. So I guess that's the key. That's the that's the key piece to the, the whole puzzle, really, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, so when we were thinking about inter, um, Internet of Things in particular, I mean, a lot of these companies are building hardware, um, and it is you know imperative for them to be partnering with large organizations. So we came up with, the, or I came up with, you know, who I thought the dream the dream team in terms of corporate partners to support in in IIoT program. And so we we basically listed them up, called them one by one, and they were pretty thrilled to participate. So I mean, we have Bosch and all of the. Um, the sensors mm -hmm. that they create. We have GE and their advanced manufacturing group. Um, we have Verizon from a distribution point of view, um, SAP and their um, and their software, and PwC when it comes to their consultative services. And so we think that that is kind of the the ecosystem in addition to the TechStars ecosystem that will really help these companies go go on their way. And so many of them um, were about. We're in a program right now. We're about two thirds of the way through the program, and many of them are partnering, have um, deals already with these big corporates, which um, would be very hard for them to garner um, without um, the facilitation that we've um, been able to put together. And I'm curious. I mean, there was an article I think in the in the Economist the other day, which was saying that these big, a lot of these big companies are are, are struggling to deal with disruption, and their their response tends to be to consolidate. And so there's a lot of companies that are consolidating now and gaining market share that way versus innovating and and you know coming up with and, and aggressively embracing new technologies. I guess what I mean, do you have a view on that? I mean, how how do you think the, these large companies are coping with these 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 shifts in the economy and these waves of disruption sweeping over them? Yeah, I mean, there's two ways to make your numbers, right? You can consolidate and cut people, or you can, um, you know, which is what all the, you know, the most famous business books, business um, business books will tell you, or you know, all the case studies will say that in those times, you need to keep on pumping um, money and resource um, into innovation, and so that's what you have, you know, in companies like GE um, and Bosch, who, you know, they do have areas where they, um, they're not seeing growth. And instead of retracting, they're putting more resource and they're um, looking at new, new ways to expand. And so, you know, I, I think uh, there's two ways to, to do this and, you know, companies have to make that decision, but I don't think we've seen a lot of long-term growth and long-term profit from companies that just, uh, retract. Sure, sure. Um, you were at uh, South by Southwest earlier on in the year and, and you talked about the, uh, the, you know, your, the, the, topic of your talk was the, the struggle is real. And this is, you know, <laughs> <laughs> referring to the founder struggle. Um, I mean, you've been on, you know, on both sides of that as a founder and now sort of mentoring founders, but also actually as, a, you know, helping um, in, in BBC, you were on the, you know, you've been, I suppose you've been on three sides of the fence, if you like, even though that's not mm -hmm. technically possible. But I, I'm just interested in and what, did you, what, 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 what's the key takeaway from the, I mean, the, the struggle is real. What, from your point of view, what was the struggle or what struggle do you see founders wrestling with now? When I built my company in New York in 2006, there was a very um, bleak <laughs> startup scene here. Um, there weren't accelerators. There was, you know, hardly any resources. If you were a company and you went to an angel event, you had to pay to pitch. I mean, it just really was, um, you know, it was a different world. And so I've really dedicated my life to this idea of it doesn't have to be that way and supporting entrepreneurs in any way that that I can. And so. Um, you know, the startup struggle is real was really about how hard it is to be a founder and how um, the highs and lows that can happen within one day mm -hmm. um, are just, you know, 
very different than if you're working in a corporate job. You know, I've worked in corporate and I've worked in startups and the emotional roller coaster um, and just how how thin the um, how 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 small the um, the the margin of error can be when you run a startup is is really um, is really pretty amazing. And so, um, yeah, I think there's a lot that um, that's really coming together right now, and it's exciting to be to be in the middle of it. So, so I mean, if you, I mean, let's get to some advice that maybe you can offer to either people sitting in large organizations who are, nest, you know, being in, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial with, without perhaps the CEO mandate at the top, or or founders who are, you know, riding that roller coaster on a daily basis. What what advice? What what worked for you, and what advice would you have for them uh, as to how to sort of, you know, short of going onto lithium? I mean, what are the options that they face, if you like, to to manage that, that emotional roller coaster? Yeah. So, I mean, for founders right now, there's so many amazing resources available, whether it's accelerators or corporate innovation programs. And there's so much, there's so many resources and there's so many amazing mentors. At this point, we've seen, um, you know, people that have gone through the journey um, and that can really provide um, fast tracking information and guidance. And so surround yourself with those people is my, my biggest piece of advice. And I think that if you're in a large company and you want to be one of those change leaders, you're going to have to be a squeaky wheel. Mm. And so if you're someone that is, um, you know, timid or just coasting by or doesn't like, um, you know, to be, to be the problem child, you're not going to have success. And so you have to be the one that's out there just constantly pushing for change. Um, and you know, it definitely will pay, pay off, but, um, not everyone's going to like you. <laughs> yeah, sure. Sure. No, it's, it's lonely stuff. And, I, and a lot of them, a lot of the previous guests have talked, you know, about how they, you know, what resources they've used as well. So, I mean, that's helpful. And maybe we can put some of those in the sh- in the show notes, Jenny, just to make, you know, so that if people are interested in, because I mean, the, the startup uh, resources are equally relevant, whether you're in a large organization or whether you're a founder, it's just a slightly different context, I guess. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, super. So what I, I'm beginning just to wrap this up, I, I sent um, three questions across to you earlier on, Jenny. Um, First question is, what have you changed your mind about recently? Well, very recently, <laughs> I changed my mind about um, the impacts of, of the U.S. election. So I think um, a lot of people are out there saying, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. And so we're taking a wait and see approach. You've seen IPOs holding off and you've seen, um, you know, entrepreneurs not really know what it's going to mean. And I think, you know, what I've changed my mind about is the impact it's going to have. And, um, I actually went from being a little bit on the wait and see to now, um, really thinking that it's going to open up lots of opportunities. I mean, you know, startups, they're like cockroaches and they'll find a way, um, Mm -hmm. no matter what. And so I think in times where there's more challenge and more uncertainty, more great companies rise to the top. So I think what I've changed my mind about is the opportunity um, and the impact it's going to have on the startup scene. Interesting. And what, what anything in particular that, that, that tipped you one that way? I mean, what, was there some new data that came in or was it more just, just a, bit, a bit more reflection, if you like? No, more reflection. I don't think it's data driven because if you look at um, Brexit, I think Brexit has um, had according to the numbers, a negative impact on funding in, in the UK. Um, and so the question is, would we see the same thing here in the US? And, and I'm, I'm saying um, out of reflection and out of my gut feeling that we're not, that we're going to see the startup ecosystem carrying on because that's what, that's what these people do. They're used to being in times of controversy. They're used to being, um, uh, n- you know, going against the grain, shall we say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, it's like a rubber band. Once it's stretched beyond a certain point, it never goes back to the same shape. So Correct. I guess there's that, there's that dynamic as well. Excellent. Second question, what do you do to remain creative and innovative? Um, yeah, so one of the things that I do, which is very unique to me, is I'm able to live in different places. <laughs> so um, I spend part of my time out on the West Coast. Um, and so when I feel like I need a real... Um, boost in, in startup culture and West coast thinking, you know, I can spend a few months out in the West coast. Um, I spend a lot of time in Europe and this summer, actually, I'll be spending a few months, um, probably in Berlin and London. Um, and so it's really about going to different places, um, surrounding myself with the people that are there, learning 
and by really being there and seeing, well, what is actually going. And so that's very rejuvenative for me. Um, and I learn a lot um, by being in different ecosystems. Yeah. I mean, one of the questions I had, maybe, um, you know, how would you characterize, I mean, you also, you've also had a startup, um, I think it was a fund manager in, in Switzerland before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I just, inter- I mean, how would you characterize a sort of startup scene in, in Central Europe, you know, Switzerland versus um, versus the West Coast, for instance. I'm just interested in do do you do you see any? Uh, maybe maybe it's the wrong question. Maybe it's more about the the entrepreneur. I mean, anything about the culture which strikes you strikes you about those two very different uh, environments. I mean, I think traditionally um, there's just been more resistance, um, just from a cultural point of view. This idea of um, going against the grain and standing out, um, as we know, is is a little bit different in in places, say Germany or Switzerland. But I think a lot of that is really starting to change with millennials. Um, I, I think that um, culturally, we're going to see much more democratization in terms of how how that is. So I think you know historically. Um, you know, I ran a startup, my co-founders were Danish and there was definitely a sense of, you know, you, you want to fit in, you don't want to be, you know, the one with your hand up. And I think that's a lot of that's starting to change. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. Third question, to what do you attribute your success in life? I mean, are there any specific skills or habits or mindsets that you've mastered, uh, that you think have had a significant impact, Jenny? Yeah, I mean, I think this idea of always, um, always learning, um, and the way that's manifest for me is kind of in five year stints of um, different um, of doing different things. So, you know, I've been in law, I've been in finance, I've run startups, I've run vent, you know, corporate venture, I've run venture, and so you know, I won't be at at doing the same thing that I'm doing in, you know, five years, um, I'll be on to the next thing. And so I think having the, um, you know, the gumption to, um, just follow what you love to do and, and make that evolve, um, is really what's made me successful. I have loved every job that I've had and it doesn't feel like work when you love what you do. And so I think that's the most important thing. And so sometimes that means you have to get out of your comfort zone, change jobs, change, you know, physical environment. So, yeah, lovely, lovely. So where can people get in touch with you, Jenny? Um, yeah, so, you know, people can follow me on Twitter at J.E. Fielding. Um, we also have a podcast around Internet of Things. Um, so you can look for us on um, on SoundCloud or on iTunes. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah, always happy to, to talk to entrepreneurs. So, you know, definitely find me, connect with me on LinkedIn or um, happy to talk anytime. Great. And we'll put that lot in the show notes. So Jenny, it's been, been great to talk to you today. I mean, it's been a long time since we last met, but it's um, you know, very, very fascinating, the trajectory of your career. I'm sure the, you know, the audience will have been found it as interesting as I have. And, um, you know, let's, let's, when you're in Europe next, next summer, uh, let's see if we can connect face to face again. That would be great. Thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Okay. Have a good day. All right. Thanks. Bye. Hi, it's Mark again. As I listened to this um, interview again, you know, I was really struck by some a, a number of themes that came out from the conversation with Jenny. I mean, firstly, a, a theme that we hear very, very frequently is around most of the resistance towards change tends to happen at the level of middle middle management. And it's easy to roll your eyes and say, well, um, go work around them. But in, in actual fact, the message that Jenny gives is it's really important to engage with them. And we've heard, um, you know, in, engage with, with the resistors, figure out what is the issues that um, that causes them difficulty to embrace a change and really work hard to to understand. And this really starts with listening. And, and we've heard, you know, from previous guests like Robert Cialdini, you know, who is the master of influence and people like Kevin Kelly. I mean, they, they talk consistently about the importance of listening. And, and this is a really important point that comes through in this conversation with Jenny. In fact, uh, Whitney Johnson also talked about it in an earlier show around why is it that we assume that um, people will accept our ideas? There's a level of, uh, what would I say, um, arrogance that we often have when we've got a strong change agenda, that we think that people will come round to our thinking once they understand it. It's not like that. It's more a case of actually understanding where people are coming from, really getting in, putting yourself in their shoes to really understand the issues and then working with them jointly to help navigate them through the changes that you're proposing. Um, Interestingly enough, this concept of the chief listening officer um, is one that I heard recently on a Future of Work um, 
podcast, I'm sorry, webinar, the CLO becoming the chief listening officer versus being the chief learning officer. So it seems like it's an emerging role in some organizations. You know, again, um, how powerful this idea of bringing people to get together and of helping others and of sharing stories um, can be in building consensus and building a platform for change in organizations. And she talks about, Jenny talks about how in the early years of the BBC, BBC Labs had far more mentors willing to support uh, startups than were needed. And this is, um, this is a theme that we, you know, we love in the innovation ecosystem world because there are increasingly people coming forward wanting to share their experiences uh, with others. And this is highlighted in our flagship program, the Innovation Leadership Circle, where people come to the event with an innovation agenda. They come to get something and they very quickly realise that actually they've got a huge amount to offer other participants who, who are facing challenges with accelerating their innovation agendas. And so it's not, it's not a one-way street. It is a, you know, the, the ecosystem is characterised by people who are willing to give as much as people who are looking to uh, take guidance, as it were. Um, the other piece here is around the startup scene, which has been hugely idealised recently. And yet, you know, uh, Jenny talks about the struggle is real. Um, this, is, this is really hard work. This is tough. You know, making sure the product market fit is, um, is you know, is properly refined and developed and, you know, underpins any, any products you bring to market. This is all really hard work. So the struggle is real and, you know, she doesn't sugarcoat it. Um, and finally, from an anthropological perspective, um, that's my background a long time ago as an anthropologist. Heidi, our marketing manager, is also an anthropologist by training. You know, we're interested in how do you incorporate the startup culture into corporate cultures? And this is, this is challenging, but I think I've said it before, the only truly sustainable source of competitive advantage comes from building a culture that consistently innovates. And so we, we have a huge amount of energy around understanding what works and what doesn't work as you're trying to fuse um, cultures together and as you're trying to develop cultures that are going to sustain the growth and the longevity and the existence and the survival of organizations and also of, shouldn't forget, of, you, of your careers in those organizations or your ability to actually continue to be relevant in these organizations as they evolve. And this really is at the heart of the purpose, the mission of the innovation ecosystem. So I hope you enjoyed this show as much as I did with Jenny. Um, leave some notes or drop, drop us a note on, um, on mark at innovationecosystem.com or leave some notes in the, um, in, the, in the bottom of the blog post on www.innovationecosystem.com. If you're interested in learning more about the ILC, the Innovation Leadership Circle, you can find out more on our website or also drop me an email. And until next week, have a great week. Mm -hmm.